Let's turn to the psalm that we read earlier, then Psalm 139. And as I said a minute ago, then this psalm is one of that string of pearls that runs through the book. Uh, psalms that celebrate the wonderful works of God. We've been seeing that in Psalm 40. And we'll see it again, hopefully, in this psalm. And there are others we may or we may not get a, an opportunity to look at. So as you turn to Psalm 139 then, this is a psalm uh, that works on different levels. And uh, thinking about this morning, I've mapped out for myself at least three levels in which you can look at this psalm. I don't know whether we'll work our way through all three this morning, but uh, I guess we'll just see how things go, see how we respond to this psalm as we work our way through it. So it's uh, another psalm of David, and this is a, a psalm in which David sits alone with God. We can't imagine David in a congregation. He's on his own. It looks very much as if he's on his own at night when he's unable to sleep. Now, if we think back to last Sunday morning, we saw that David in Psalm 40 is in a congregation of believers. He's there on the Lord's day. And around him, everyone is worshipping God, singing the praises of God. But David's heart isn't in it. David doesn't feel as if he can rejoice and magnify God like everyone else. But his thoughts are still about God even as he's there amongst God's people. Here, David is on his own. And as you look at verses 17 and 18 in this psalm, especially verse 18, where he says, when I awake, I am still with you. That doesn't mean when he wakes up. That means when he lies awake. So it's very likely that David is in the early hours of the morning, unable to sleep, because of all that's going on for him. So that's the, the picture that you need to bear in mind then. Imagine, David, you've been there yourself. For whatever reason, you're unable to sleep. And uh, he doesn't count sheep. What he does, you can see it in the psalm, is he counts the thoughts of God. Verse 18. Go back a verse, verse 17. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand, and when I lie awake, I am still with you. So, unable to sleep, David thinks about God. And I wonder how many of us do that when we can't sleep. It seems to me that one night a week, I'm unable to sleep. No reason, as far as I can tell. You're lying there. You might have dropped off initially, but then you wake. And then when you're awake, you can't get back to sleep. What do we do when we lie there, unable to sleep? Well, if David's anything to go by, we should fill our minds with thoughts about God. So the first thing I want to show you is the kind of thoughts that David has about God. From verse 1 through to verse 6, David has the thoughts about the knowledge of God. What does God know? And if you fancy some, uh, some words, some technical terms, what you have between verses 1 and 6 is the omniscience of God. God knows everything. So David, lying awake, begins his meditation on God by thinking about God knowing all things. And you can see that, can't you, uh, in the verses. You know when I stand up, you know when I sit down, you know my path, you know everything. God's knowledge is the knowledge of everything. 
And then verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. And I think that's easy to imagine, David. He's thought about the omniscience of God. God who knows all things. And then by verse 6, he's so amazed at this idea that his head starts to hurt and his brain starts to ache because these thoughts are so high. So you've got the omniscience of God, God who knows all things. And then as you look from verse 7 down to verse 12, I'm sure all of you can come up with another term that begins with the letter O, because what you have there is the omnipresence of God. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. God is everywhere. And I can't imagine, and David is lying there, wide awake, trying to imagine any situation that he could find himself in where he is absent from God, where God cannot be with him, where his presence cannot be known. Now, of course, as you look at verses 7 through to 12, David is thinking in terms of geography. If I was to go here or go there or walk there or fly there, but, but you can also imagine it in terms of your circumstances. Are there any circumstances in which I could find myself separated from God? God is everywhere at once the omnipresence of God. So David, thinking about God, has thought these thoughts. And then as you turn to verses 13 and onwards, can you see what else David then does? 13 to, say, halfway through verse 16. David thinks about God as the God of creation. You formed me in my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. And I wonder, I don't know the answer, but I'm wondering why is David thinking about himself as he lies on the bed in this way? Why is he going back to his past and to his childhood? Why is he going even further uh, before he was? Why is he doing that then as he lies there? But he's thinking about the God of creation. And that takes us to verse 16. The eyes, your eyes, saw my substance, are being yet unformed. Now, they are wonderful verses that speak about the, the work of God in creating us and the knowledge of God whilst we were still in our mother's wombs. Now, there's a huge significance here for David, which we may see on another occasion. It's the God of creation there that he thinks about. And then at the end of verse 16, you see it there, he slips in just in a few lines, one of the most amazing statements you can ever think about in relation to God. In your book, they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. And David moves from thinking about God, the creator, to thinking about the God of providence. All my days have been mapped out by God when as yet there was not one of them. So still thinking about himself in his mother's womb and thinking about God putting David together knitting David in his mother's womb. He then says, when I was in my mother's womb, all my days were planned out by God. They were all written in the book of God. So however David is, whatever age he is now, as he lies on his bed, unable to sleep, he recognizes that every day that has brought him to that point, every moment in his life, as it has worked itself out to that very moment, was laid out by God, even before they were yet 
enacted. It's an amazing verse, verse 16. So verses 17 and 18, you get a pause in verses 17 and 18, whilst David is lying on his bed and he's thought about the omniscient God and the omnipresent God and the creator God and the God of providence. And just for a moment, there's David saying, this is all so wonderful, so precious to think about God like that. I guess if you can't sleep, and you're lying there thinking about whatever's worrying you, you're not likely, are you, to suddenly have a moment and say, how wonderful is this? I'm lying wide awake thinking about my worries. That's not going to happen, is it? But if you lie there wide awake, and your mind is on God, and you start with what you know about God, then you may well have such a moment. Let's have a look then at these troubling verses, 19 to 22. These are not nice verses, but you need to see them like this. What David is doing is he's thinking about the victorious God, the God who will defeat his enemies, the God who will triumph over everything, who will accomplish his purpose, who will set up his kingdom, the God who will reign forever and ever and ever, the God of triumph and victory. That's what those verses are telling us from verse 19 to 22. And then this meditation ends with verses 23 and 24. And we come, if you like, from this big picture that David has been building in his head, these high thoughts that are too wonderful for him. We come from that big picture in these final two verses to to David. We come to him now. And uh, he's, if you like, brought his thoughts to himself at last. It's the last thing he does, but he does bring his thoughts to himself. Take a look at verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, and know my anxieties. Now, isn't that great? Because David finishes with his anxieties. He doesn't start with them when he lies there awake. His anxieties aren't all that he thinks about at all. He ends by thinking about his anxieties. What's keeping him awake? Well, he comes in the end and he brings it to God. And he says, God, whatever anxiety is keeping me awake, you know it. You know it. I hand it over to you, and you know it. And then verse 24, see if there's any wicked way in me. So, so there's a, a moment there in which David says, well, okay, is there something that I need to realize about myself? In this situation, is there a lesson I need to learn? Something I've not seen. Is there some insight I need into myself at this point in my life? Because all of us lack insight into ourselves. We can see each other's faults, but we can't see our own. So here is David then saying to God, okay, then, is there something I've got to learn that I've been missing, that I'm blind to? in this situation that I'm in. Show me, teach me. David is, is willing, he's, he's teachable in Psalm 24. And then it ends with the God of the future. Lead me in the way everlasting. So there's a, a pastoral imagery there. It's God the shepherd. And David is imagining himself now in his relationship with the shepherd. Lead me, lead me in the paths, like Psalm 23 the paths of righteousness. David is saying, the future is yours, O God. I don't know it. You do. You lead me there. Now, that's the psalm in a very rushed way. And uh, at this point, I want to ask you just to realize one thing. As David lies there on his bed, and he's thinking about God, he's got these big thoughts about God. But you see what he does. He makes all these great big thoughts about God, he makes them personal. So he's not studying God as if God is a subject. 
He's not coming to God as if God is a textbook and he needs to learn theory. He is applying all his knowledge of God to himself. And that, if we forget anything, everything else today, that is what all of us need help to do. So the God who knows everything, he knows me. Do you see what David is doing then? He's not saying as if he's writing an essay. Oh, God's omniscient. He knows everything. David is saying he knows everything about me. He's making it personal. He knows my thoughts. He knows my actions. He knows my habits. He knows my routines. He knows what my working week is like. He knows what my family life is like. So he's bringing that knowledge of God, how God knows everything, and David is grounding it in his own experience and saying, God knows me. And that's what you need to do. If you think about God as the God of everlasting love, then you say his love is a love for me so you bring it down to yourself and you make it personal and you make use of what you know about god and you apply what you know about god to yourself and to your own situation so god knows everything look at verses 7 to 12 god is everywhere and god is everywhere for me so wherever I go, and whatever's going on for me, and whatever situation I'm in, if it's the best of situations when I'm in heaven, if it's the worst of times when I'm in hell, if it's day and sunshine, or if it's the darkest night, God is there. So he takes this doctrine about the omnipresence of God and he makes it personal. So again, whatever my situation, my location, whatever my place, whatever my circumstance, God's full presence is here with me in these moments. Now, do you get this idea? So when you're lying awake and you can't sleep and you're thinking about God, and you bring all that knowledge that you've built up over the years, every Bible study that you've been in, you bring all that knowledge right down to where you're at. Bring it down, root it and ground it in your situation. And you use these words, I and you, you, oh God, and I, you know me, that's where I'm at. I'm sure you see it, don't you? Keep going down the psalm. So the God of creation, verses 13 to 16, you formed me. He's not talking about the seas and the mountains and the stars. He's not talking about God creating time and all the animals. He's saying God made me and he formed me. And when I was hidden in my mother's womb, God knew me. So there he is again, doing exactly the same, making it personal to himself, this knowledge of God. But I hope you see this idea here in the psalm. And if you do, just look down the rest of the psalm and see how David continues. This God who knows all things and is everywhere, he's planned my days and he's fashioned my life. And he's ordered my timeline, if you like, verse 16. Now, this is the first lesson, I think, from Psalm 139. You make it personal. You think about God. And you make him your God. Let's ask God to help us do that then, as we take a moment to pray. Lord, all of us have known what it is to lie awake. Perhaps some of us lie awake more than others. Perhaps some of us sleep really well. And we've had those moments when we lie awake. And Lord, what we do is we think about what's on our mind. Sometimes we lie awake and there doesn't seem to be anything wrong. But what we see with David is how he begins 
to think about you, what he knows about you. And Lord, thinking those big thoughts that you were the omnipresent God and the omniscient God and the creator God, thinking those great and wonderful thoughts, he makes it personal. And Lord, whatever situation we're in, whatever we know about you, whatever, whatever we've learned over the years, help us, our God, to make it personal. Because Paul also says, he loved me and gave himself for me. So Lord, as we commit this first lesson then from the psalm to you, asking you to help us remember it, we do pray for your blessing upon us. Amen. Now, we've got some time to do the second lesson. So I, what I want to show you is verses 7 to 12. What seems to be going on here is the reason for David lying awake at night. Um, I want to show you, if I can, the structure from verses 7 down to 12. So if you start at verse 7, you start with the word way. And then that's followed by a whole series of statements that begin with if. Let me show you. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, if I take the wings of the morning, if I say surely the darkness shall hide me, what we've got here is known as a way if construction and the idea behind this is that david has reached a point where he has to make a decision and he doesn't know what decision to make so he's lying awake because he doesn't know what to do and he's thinking to himself how am i going to decide where can I go? So what can I do? It's a very similar construction. What way? What's the options? And then as he goes down through them, if I do this one, and if I do that one, and if I do the other one, then what will be the outcome? So here you have David giving you a pattern of indecision. He's under pressure. He's not sure which action to take. What would be the right thing to do? And so as he lies there awake, he brings his thoughts of God into that situation. And he's exploring options for a possible course of action. And as he does that, then he thinks to himself, okay, let's do it like this. Where do I go? Where do I go? What, that's that's the, the, the decision he has to make. The situation he's in. Which path do I take? And he thinks, if I take this one, the high one, or if I take the low one, or if I take the dark one, where will I go and how will it end up? And so what David does in bringing God into his decision making, David realizes that whatever decision he makes, God will know it already. God will be present with him. If he takes the high path, God will be there. If he takes the low one, the dark one, the light one, God will be there. So whatever decision, whatever path, he has this guarantee of the continuing presence of God with him. Where shall I go? What shall I do? Well, God is the God who created me. He put me together in my mother's womb. All the skills, all the talents, all the abilities I got, God put them together when he created me in my mother's womb. David is looking at how God made him to give him confidence that he would make the right decision. Because God, who has framed him, has given him all he needs in order to act. And then verse 16, and whatever decision I make, God has already written it in his book. 
He's already numbered the days. He's planned them out before I was even born. So here I am struggling with a decision. What should I do? Where should I go? But God has mapped it out for me from the very beginning. He knows he is with me. He has made me and he has planned all things. David is finding assurance and confidence as he lays there on his bed. Bring it all the way down to verses 23 and 24. This anxiety he's got, how does he decide? What does he do? What's the right path? He says, God, is there anything I'm missing? Anything that I'm acting from that I shouldn't be? Am I tempted to make a decision here for the wrong reasons. May I be acting out of pride? Am I acting out of spite? Am I acting out of despair? (coughs) What's going on with me, God? So search me and know me. Look at how verse 23 works. Search me and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. Now that's crucial, isn't it? Because if you're about to make a decision, or you're not sure which direction to go in, what step should you take next, you really need to be sure that your heart is right. That there's not some motivation in that heart that might be unhelpful in the long term. So God, search me and know me. Test me. See if there is anything going on here now. That, that is that is dishonorable in my decision making and know my anxieties know why i find this such a difficult decision to make and then verse 24 lead me in the way everlasting so i've thought about the fact that whatever decision i make you've planned it out you'll be with me you know it already I've thought all of this, God. I've made all my knowledge of you. I brought it to bear on this decision. And now I'm saying, lead me in the way. I'll make my decision. I'll choose my path. You lead me in the way. So it's about decision making. It's about indecision. And I don't know whether any of you are at a moment of decision, whether you are facing big decisions or little decisions. I don't know if any of you are not sure what to do next, what's the right path to take. But here is David lying awake as he tries to figure it all out. And he brings God into his thoughts. And he does all this, as we've seen, search me as well. Is there anything going on in me that shouldn't be there? And then lead me in the way everlasting. Well, let's ask God's help as we commit this part of the psalm to him. Lord, we don't know, you do, whether one another needs to make decisions, whether we have paths ahead of us that we don't know which to be right. Lord, we have decisions all the time, big and little, that we need to make. And sometimes those decisions keep us awake. Lord, as we think about that, we want to bring what we know about you to be on our decisions. Whatever path we are needing to choose, you know, you'll be there. You've already planned. You've given us the talent and the skills to make such a decision. And Lord, we do need to be tested in a sense. We can make decisions for the wrong reasons and in the wrong ways. But Lord, we look to you then to search us and to know us, to know our anxieties, and then to lead us in your paths. So we commend this second lesson from the psalm to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Just for a moment. And I want you to see there that the knowledge of God can be used to heal us. And I don't necessarily mean to heal us physically, but to heal us nonetheless. 
And if we can just do this quickly, let me show you what I mean. So verses 13 to 15, what we are seeing there is that God knows our bodies. Can you see it there? You formed my inward parts. You covered me in my wonderful and my mother's womb. Verse 14, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I was made in secret. I was skillfully wrought. You saw my substance. This is the idea that God knows our physical bodies. He knows how we are made. He has created our bodies. And whatever's true of them, whatever condition they're in, whatever may be right or wrong with our bodies, we have a God who knows. And so if we are worried about our bodies, if we worry about ill health, if we worry about unknown illnesses and diseases, and we are worrying about the effects on our skeletons or our hearts or our blood pressure, and that's fine to worry, and it's fine to have medical treatment, of course, but there's this layer, this layer of knowledge that God has about our bodies and the care he has taken in shaping our bodies and the knowledge and the power of God that has gone into putting us into the bodies that we have. Now, this is fundamental to the psalm. And it's fundamental to David as he lies awake. Maybe he has a decision to make about treatment. He may be ill and he may be needing to make a decision. He may be ill and he has to decide, does he go to war? We don't know. But somehow or other, the decision he has to make is linked to how he is physically. He's not well, maybe. Perhaps he's too old in his own mind to start something new. So he brings into effect the knowledge that God has of him, his body, its condition, how long it lasts, what it's like. None of this is a secret to God. It's been fashioned, and that's a great word. So if any of you are worrying about your health, your bodies, the situations you're in, should you make a decision? Are you too old? Are you too ill? God brings that awareness to you of what he knows, how he knows it, and how he has given shape for you. Well, time is going. Just go down the paths. And can you see how the healing knowledge of God in this psalm? God knows my body. Verse 16, he knows my days. Verses 17 and 18, God knows my nights. And verse 24. God knows my paths. Well, let's pray.